the love of God was manifested in us, that God has, on, has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Thank you, Tim. It's a great day to be able to worship God today. There's so many things going on. It's, uh, it's one of those exciting times. We've got Joshua coming next week, and so uh, he'll be able to speak, and you'll get a chance to hear him and hear what what he's like and get to meet his wife and uh, everything. So that's, that's just going to be a good time to be able to uh, meet them and get to know them a little bit next week. So good things happening. We're going to pack backpacks. I understand there's ice cream. Is that right? John's got ice cream for everybody who comes and packs backpacks. That's going to be good. Actually, we're doing teacher bags. And so if you just come and, and pack teacher bags, all of the things that you have been bringing on Saturday, uh, that's going to be a great thing just to be able to see and, and be able to put those things together. So lots of good things. Uh, we have had an intern for the whole summer for a couple of months, Mr. Jacob. Uh, Brandon outlined a whole summer's worth of activities and said, here, Jacob. And... Uh, this is his, he's not leaving yet, but he's actually not going to work either. So, not sure about that one, but uh, anyway, Jacob has been great this summer. He's done all kinds of things with the kids. Uh, I actually got to go on a trip with him. That was really exciting to get to go to Salt River and watch kids as we floated down the Salt River. It was an amazing time. And then there's that realization that comes over Jacob's face when he realizes there's three kids stuck up here and the other ones are going way away down there and <laughs> it was just kind of priceless to, <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> but uh, the good thing is we came back with the same number of bodies and most of them had the same color hair. So that was a good thing. So no, Jacob's done a fantastic job in not only uh, doing some of the activities, but actually building the group. Because I understand Brandon said they had 44 in class last week. And so that's really great to, to see how that's built. And we're going to have a youth minister who moves in and will be permanent now and who's already off on a run and start. And so that's that's just really great. So... We're glad you're, you worked with us this summer, and uh, now that you're off, you can bring donuts on Monday. <laughs> You'll have plenty of time, so anyway. One of the things we're going to talk about this week is about love, and I think it's one of those things that, you know, you can just really go anywhere with it. There, there's so much information, it's hard to know where to start and what, what all to do, and, and so it's one of those things that is is a little bit difficult to just bring it down to a smaller level. And actually, as you follow in the Believe book and look at what we've been doing, we've been doing the, the different reasons why we would believe, some of the doctrines we would believe, and then some of the actions that believe would bring about. And then now we're on the last part of this is what, what we become because we believe. And most of these are going to be about the fruit of the Spirit. There are nine fruits of the Spirit. There are ten weeks left. So I'll let you find which one is not, but also one of those great qualities that we become and one of those things that we're able to have as, as we start this process is the things that the Spirit produces in us. And you may be aware that people all have natural traits, Everybody is born with something, the, the spirit is able to produce something, but 
Also, we're just born with different traits. Some people are extroverted, some people are introverted, and I'm not sure you can really change that. We can push it a little bit and, and get a person to be a little bit more outgoing and try and calm down the other person, but uh, you can't really change it. There's type A's and type B's. We label them that way sometimes, and uh, you're just not going to be able to, to change a personality. And so personality is something that's just put in. It's unique. It's from God. But you don't change personality. You're just going to have those traits. And you're able to do some things with that. Basically, the difference between extroverts and introverts is an extrovert gets fueled by the party by the group, by everybody who's around, and man, he's just so hyper afterwards when, whenever there's a group of people together, and the introvert just gets drained by all those people that are around, and by that party, and by all the stuff he had to do, and by, oh, it's just so draining, I need a, I need a nap. And maybe that's just an easy way to think that, you know, we, we can both go to the party, we can both go to the group, but we're going to get different things as, as we deal with that. So there are different personalities that we have. Some people are, are funny. Some people are smart. Some people are analytic. Some people think they're smart. Some people think they're funny. Uh, there are serious people. There's all kinds of people that we have that are all different. But when it comes to our character, that seems to be a little bit changeable. The other stuff I'm not sure you can change. You can push it a little, but you can't really change it. But character is what you value and what you follow. And so that comes from what you're going to believe. And so when you believe something, it changes what you value. And when you value something, it's able to, to match the values that God has. And when we believe God's word and we change our values... Our character changes to match those values. It's called being in the image of God. God started us there. He created us to be there, to be in his image. And yet I don't think we stayed there. And as you look at the world around us and you realize how many different people we have, they really don't understand this. They really don't understand what good character even is, and a lot of them don't grow up in households where there is good character, or they're not even encouraged to do that. They're encouraged to get whatever you can while you can, and it's not about trying to be good, or trying to have any ethics, or trying to have any values whatsoever at all. And so we live in a very different world now, but this is what happens with Christianity. We are able to do this. We are able to change from a person who's been away from God, who's been in the world, who's been sinful, who didn't grow up with that, into the very character and nature of God. Not the personality, but the character of God. And so to value what he values, to realize what's important to him, to follow God, we are able to get back to that image of God. Now, it isn't a fast process. And some people are just going to keep the same old character, and they're never really going to understand what it's all about. And they're never really going to be able to love, specifically as we deal with that today. When you do realize what God's about and you follow God, we find that completeness. We find maturity. We find fulfillment. We find a calmness about life and a peace that we're able to have. And that's all of these characteristics that we're going to be talking about. But when your actions don't match what you say, you find people that are just fighting with themselves. And they don't know what's wrong, but they're just kind of mad at everybody. It's just kind of the way it is. They don't think it's right. They don't think anything's fair. And, you know, it's all about trying to find that character of God so we can find that kind of peace. So the first characteristic we're going to talk about today is about love. And that's kind of a long introduction to say this is what we're going to be doing from, from now for the next 20, 10 weeks. Love's the most important thing you can give somebody. If you don't get anything else but that, I want you to remember that. Love is the most important thing you can give somebody. 
We've already listened to the passage that talks about how much God loves us, and we realize that God is the one who is making, he starts love in the very beginning. Our love comes from God, and John writes it, it wasn't, his name wasn't first John, just John, but he writes the gospel, he writes Revelation, he writes first, second, third John, and this whole gospel, or this whole letter that he's writing in First John is all about love, and about love, and about love, and you would look at that and go, wow, this guy must, you know, he's pretty an emotional guy. No. That just proves the point. This is one of the sons of thunder. When you realize that, you realize, well, maybe there's a little bit of a temper issue with him, and yeah, he's the guy who said, you know, when we're going back to Jerusalem and they don't want to accept us along the way and they don't want to help us, he says, can't we just call fire down and burn them up? You know, it doesn't sound like a real loving kind of guy, and I'm not sure that he ever was. I mean, he's the fisherman. He's the rough, tough guy. But when God gets a hold of him, he says, here's what I value most, that God loves me and that I am able to be a loving person because God loves me. And so he writes this incredible thing about the love that God has for us. And the first thing that he's going to be able to write to us is that God is love. And so he talks about this, whoever's born of God. He says, you know, if you love, you're born of God. And so he said, sometimes even people who start at a different place, who don't grow up with that love, are able to be reborn in by God and start all over again. We have to start all over again in order to be that loving person. Some people didn't grow up with a loving family. So they really don't know quite what love's about, and they, you know, try and do what they can with it. But, you know, he says, here's where you begin. It all begins with God. And then he tells us that God shows his love and that he sent his only son into this world to die for us, to be the propitiation, to be that sacrifice, to be that payment that makes us able to be forgiven of our sins. And so he sent Jesus to be that sacrifice so that we are able to have salvation, so that we are able to have eternal life, so that we are able to have heaven, so that we are able to be loving people. He says that's what God does. And if God loves, we ought to love other people as well. And so we haven't seen God. We don't know what God, we know a little bit about what God's like from the scripture, but, you know, we haven't really seen him. But you see all these other people. And we might say, yeah, and that's pretty obvious why we wouldn't love them then, right? Have you seen all those people? No, if you've understood what God said, he loves you. And yeah, you're just like them, and he saw you. And so he says, I want you to practice on all these other people around until it becomes something that is in your character, something that is your nature that you love because God loves you. And we love because it is our character. He continues in 1 John chapter 4, look at verse 13 with me. He says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar, for he does not love his brother whom, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him Whoever loves God must also love his brother. 
Okay, don't get lost in all this because it looks like there's a lot of loving, a lot of abiding, all this stuff going on. Let's unpack this a little bit and talk about what he's really saying. We know that we live in God because he's given us his spirit. I don't know if you've thought about that before, but it's a very intimate relationship with God. He's put his spirit inside your skin. That's the way it works. It's inside of you. He's put his spirit, part of who he is, into you. And he sent his son so that he could be savior of the world. We're familiar with Jesus. We hear about Jesus. We know about his cross, but that cross means God loves you. And that's really what it's about, and that he would act first, that he would do that first. And he does that so that you can have confidence in the day of judgment. That seems so strange. Because when I was growing up, it seemed like the thing we were supposed to do is be afraid of judgment. That's what we used most often. You know, you go to hell if you mess up, if you sin. That's not love. And so we threaten people into heaven. I'm not really sure you can do that. And we never develop the character of God. Because it was more about scaring people and threatening people and talking about how terrible it's going to be and, you know, all the fire of hell and how it's going to be awful and all this kind of stuff. And yes, that's true. But he says, I put my spirit in you so that you can learn how to love. Not so that you can be scared, but so that when you approach judgment day, you can say, oh boy, this is going to be so good. Because this is going to be great. He's talked about reward. I've got treasure laid up in heaven. There's all this that I know has been coming that he's been promising as soon as Jesus comes back. And that's going to be the most exciting thing when we get to judgment day, isn't it? What a great thing that's going to be. It's not something to be afraid of. He says, I want you to be able to have confidence in the day of judgment. He says, we're like him in this world. You think Paul was worried about judgment? Do you think he's going to approach judgment and be really concerned and say, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to make it? I don't think he's going to be scared at all. I don't think he ever has been in his ministry, and I don't think he would be now. But when you look at the life of Paul, you realize he's a guy who used to persecute the church. I mean, he threw people in jail. He killed Christians. I think he ought to be worried. But he's not. Why not? He's the guy who writes the love chapter. Because he has confidence in the day of judgment. He has confidence that God sent his son. He has confidence that God loves you this much. He has confidence that love is bigger than sin and grace is bigger than sin. And God did not do this lightly. It's not just a little thing. He says, well, you know, I hope it kind of covers like that, you know, we're trying to save and get our budget just right. And you get to the end of the month and okay, let's, let's don't go out, let's don't spend anything, let's just stay home and we've got crackers. That's not what it's like with God. He's not trying to stretch it to be able to cover just enough grace to get all those sins covered. He says, no, Jesus came and he offered such a huge amount of love because he died on a cross for your sins. If that's not big enough to cover everything, he says, that's big enough to cover my murders. Really? I don't even have murders yet. <laughs> so maybe I'll be okay. Maybe judgment time will be all right and things are able to work out and I'm able to, yeah, have confidence in the day of judgment because Paul looked at the, he had killed some, Stephen.
Type A personality, he's still extrovert, he's still in people's faces. But as he writes 1 Corinthians 13 to a group of Christians who's struggling so hard with their own arrogance and pride, he says, I want you to realize love is first. It is the most important spiritual gift you will ever get. And Paul has no fear of judgment even with his crimes against God. There's no fear in love. I don't think Paul has that. No fear in love. Sometimes when you see kids jumping to each other, jumping to dad, why would they do that? They're laughing. It's going to be fun. Okay, this would be a little scary. But you know He's going to catch you. You know he's not going to miss. You have every confidence in God. You have every confidence in your father. I don't know why it is that kids like to be thrown in the air. Throw me higher. Are you kidding? You could break something. But there is no fear because there is absolutely no chance that he will drop you. He would break all of his bones first. There is no chance he will. Because we have that kind of confidence. We know that. And fear is about punishment. And scared people don't know how to love. They're not complete in love. I mean, they try. But if you're unsure that God loves them, then you're going to be afraid that you aren't worthy. And you aren't. That's not the point. Because love is not about being worthy. It's about doing the best for somebody else. And we believe that God loves we believe that God, in a huge way, loves more than anything else. And he will never miss as you fly through the air to have him catch. We love because he loved us first. When we were people who were not lovable, we love at all because he loved us first. We love anyone because he loved us first. And that's what he says in First John. And his spirit in us makes us people who are able to love. But again, we don't see God. We just know it. We understand it. But we see all these other people. He says, you know, if you can't learn to love other people, when you can see them, you really don't understand about God. And we take God's love and realize that he loves us and he cares about us and we apply that. And we bring it into our character and we make it our nature so that now it is our nature to be able to love all those other people who are maybe not so lovable. They don't act so right. But we are able to do that because character has changed and our nature has changed and so now we're completely different. And we spread God's word to the world. And so the Spirit comes and he puts that spirit in us and it produces that first characteristic called love. And so we receive that Holy Spirit, that fruit of that spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit when we're baptized into Christ. I don't have time to unpack all of that, but that's basically what happens. And when we repent of our sins and confess our faith in God and Jesus as his son and and we form a covenant with God by that act of baptism, that response of faith that says God allows us, God cleanses us, God is, is there to love us, and he adds us to his kingdom, he adds us to his church, and we are all joined together with that one spirit. And there are so many passages that talk about love. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The two biggest commandments, love God and love your neighbor. Everything else hangs on that. Jesus says, love your enemies. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. But as he's explaining this about the Spirit and about how the Spirit comes into us, he, he talks about it as a couple of different natures and about a change between flesh and spirit and so look at Galatians 5 with me and start with verse 16 he says I'm going to read you the normal version first 
He says, I say, walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other and keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we probably read that a lot. And said, yeah, those are all things that are bad. We shouldn't do those. And what are they again? Well, they're, yeah, all that stuff. And we would never do those. We would never have idols. Because, you know, I don't have any gold statues sitting around my house. Maybe you got a boat, but don't have any gold statues sitting around a house. Maybe got a nice car, but I don't have. I want to read it to you again in a different version, starting about verse 19. This one's from the message. And the message isn't a translation. It's a way of saying it different. But maybe it'll help us realize what he's really trying to say here. He says, it's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, intemperance to love or to be loved, or impotence to love or to be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, Ugly parodies of community. And I could go on. This isn't the first time I've warned you, you know. But if you use your freedom in this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. Does that make it any clearer? It is. Most of the world lives that way. Loveless, cheap accumulations of emotional garbage. That's not good. Joyless grabs for happiness. Impotent to love or to being loved. It's a person who's been completely destroyed by who he is and by those cravings that are within him. It's the worst. And, and probably the worst thing about it is there's no way out. It won't get better. And the harder you try... To make yourself happy, the worse it gets. Because after all, it's all about you and making you happy. And it just gets worse and worse. And you don't get to love God or to be loved by God when this happens. And you don't go to heaven. It is an excitingly terrible way to live. And you destroy yourself. I'm not saying it's not exciting. It is very exciting. I mean, to have that much going on in your life, that much conflict in your life, that much chaos in your life, it is extremely exciting. You know, like that excitement you get about four feet before a crash going at 60 miles an hour. <gasps> and that's the way people live. Boy, this is exciting. <gasps> My life's about to explode. <gasps> I love it so much. And they find no love and no peace and no joy and no anything here because, wow, aren't we exciting? I don't want to be that excited. I would rather have a little bit of love and a little bit of peace and a little bit of patience and calmness and that somebody actually cares enough to overlook all the junk that's happened in my life and said, you know what, I'm going to take you anyway. 
because I sent my son to be the sacrifice for your sin. And I'm going to love you that much so that that excitement that you live, with, that, that where your life is about to crash and it flashes before your eyes and you think, wow, this is, this is fun. Not so much. You ought to see what God has. You ought to see what God's able to do this because he gives you the next part of this. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, and those who have not have none of these. There is no love, there is no joy, no peace, no patience, no kindness. I don't mean that they don't have some that they've developed along the line, but they don't have gods. And it's not because a spirit is within them. It's not something that can make an angry person and change him into a loving person and a joyful person and a peaceful person when, you know what, he grew up in such a terrible way that he just, he just couldn't help it. And God says, you can be born again, and you can start over, and I'll put my spirit in you. And when you realize those values, and you adopt those values, and you believe in those things, it changes who you are into a person like God, into his image, so that he is able to do these things, so that he is able to put this fruit of the spirit into your life. And that spirit begins to produce fruit. first thing it produces is love. And we understand we're loved by God, and we understand how to love other people, and we understand the chaos and the, and the violence that we had had before just isn't worth it. And we begin to trust that someone would actually do this for us, that someone would want what's best for us, and it's that intimacy you can have with the Creator God, with somebody who is so huge. You're never going to fall. And he feels our wishes. He feels our wants because his spirit is inside of us and he feels what we feel. And he says, I understand. Now let's do better. And it's that kind of intimacy that makes us say, I'm going to follow you, God. So let me just ask, where are you now? Where you're still fighting the struggle and still fighting to... You live that exciting life. It's exciting. Are you going to actually be able to love somebody in your lifetime? Do you feel loved by God this morning? Boy, it's amazing when that happens. He's been able to put his spirit into your skin, and now you feel God. Because when he puts himself that much into your life, it changes your thinking, it changes your behavior, it changes your character. So when he says, if you keep my commandments, you're going to find that kind of love, we say, yes. Do you struggle with being loved? You know, God shows you how to do that. He's the source, he's the main way, he's the main place where that all begins. And so let him show you how to do that every day because that's how love happens every day. You let God grow something great inside of you. You see, if you don't have that, you're missing it. Let God show you what it's like to love and to be loved. Maybe we can help you with that today. We can certainly pray to God and talk to him, and you know what, he doesn't turn anybody away. That's the great part about love. He says, let's find a way to make this work, and it can work in your life. If we can help you today, would you come while we stand and sing?